Joan has Joan is a is a, dis, a distinguished translator of Latin American literature, especially the work of the uh, noted poet Juan Helman, uh, uh, University of California Press. Oh, there. Never fails to give me a plug on that. Well, you know, um, uh, James Stevens accepted. James Joyce accepted. Uh, so many uh, of, of the great Irish writers were Anglo-Irish. And uh, I think that what inspired them was the, was the Irish people. Now, you know, the Irish people are a people who have, have lived in tremendous poverty for a long, long time. And now all the rich Americans are moving over there and buying up little old churches and schoolhouses. And um, so we're, we're going to leave our mark, as they have, the Irish have left their mark on this country, 40 million Irish Americans. But in celebration of, of the Irish people, I wanted to read a little bit from a book called The Last of the Name by a man named Charles McGlinchey. And the little ep epigram here says, so whenever I die, they will know where to bury me. And after my day, the grave will not be opened again, for I am the last of the name. And this is a little bit on the healing methods. As, as you, there wasn't much money for, for doctors if there were doctors. And as we all know, the Irish have never suffered from the distractions of wealth. As according to, <laughs> according to B.J. Kavanaugh. So here he says, um, for cuts and sores, I often use St. Patrick's leaf, or as some people call it, the healing leaf. Now, whether that's the shamrock, I don't know. You just chewed it up and put it on the cut. A cobweb on a bleeding cut helped the blood to freeze and stop the bleeding. If there was a beeling or a stony bruise that needed drawing, the leaf of the foxglove warmed over a coal, drew out whatever poison was in it. The ox tongue herb was used in the same way. The lick of a dog's tongue was good for a cut or a sore that wasn't healing up right. There's a cure on the dog's tongue. The fox's tongue was supposed to have great drawing power. Whenever a fox was caught, someone always wanted the tongue. At a time when pigs or cattle were killed, the bladder was blown up and dried, and there's nothing better for a cut heel or toe than a piece of the pig's bladder. Oak bark was a great cure for sore feet. The bark was steeped in water for a day or two, and the water was good for hardening the skin of the feet in the summertime. Now, if people took a pain in the pit of the stomach and it lasted for weeks, that meant the spool of the breast had fallen. It came from a hurt, or if a man stressed himself. No St. John's wort and psychiatrists for these people. Uh, a bone or gristle below where the ribs meet in front was supposed to fall in and press on the stomach. The cure for that was to lift the spool of the breast. Paddy Doherty could do it. He put a penny on the spot and a short candle sitting on the penny. The candle was lit and a tumbler put upside down over the candle and kept close to the skin till the candle was smothered for want of air. That drew the skin a bit into the tumbler and that helped to lift the spool of the breast from on top of the stomach. <laughs> yeah. I, I also would like to read uh, one of the Irish uh, folk stories and fairy tales that William Butler Yeats collected. <clears throat> he was an Anglo-Irishman, but he knew where Ireland's treasure lay. Uh, this is a, the, called the White Trout. A legend of Kong. Now, Kong, have any of you ever been to Kong? Yes. Kong is where the quiet man was made. Very beautiful place. And I'm told that they're trying to make a movie about the, the making of the, the uh, quiet man, but every time they, they think they're ready to start filming, one of the stars emigrates. <laughs> 
that, that comes from a wonderful book called The Lie of the Lamb by Fintan O'Toole. I couldn't recommend it hi highly enough. It's just wonderful. Okay, now this is the white trout. There was once upon a time long ago a beautiful lady that lived in a castle upon the lake beyond, and they say she was promised to a king's son, and they were to be married, when all of a sudden he was murdered. The creator, Lord help us, was thrown into the lake above, and so of course he couldn't keep his promise to the fairy lady, and more's the pity. Well, the story goes that she went out of her mind because of losing the king's son, for she was tender-hearted, God help her, like the rest of us, and pined away after him, until at last no one uh, about her, good or bad, uh, was seen, and the story went that the fairies took her away. Well, sir, in course of time, the white trout, God bless it, was seen in the stream beyond. I'm sure the people didn't know what to think of the creature, seeing how a white trout was never heard of afore nor since, and years upon years the trout was there, just as when you've seen it this blessed minute. Longer nor I can tell, I throng, and beyond the memory of it, the oldest in the village. At last the people began to think it must be a fairy, for what else could it be? And no hurt nor harm was ever put on the white throat until some wicked sinners of soldiers came to these parts and laughed at all the people. You can imagine what kind of soldiers they were. And laughed at all the people and jibed and jeered them for thinking of the likes. And one of them in particular, bad luck to him, God forgive me for saying it, swore he'd catch the throat and ate it for his dinner, the black. Well, what would you think of the villainy of the soldier? Sure enough, he cuts the trout and away with him home and puts him in the frying pan and into, the, into it he pitches the pretty little thing. The trout squealed, all as one as a Christian crater. And my dear, you'd think the soldier had split his sides laughing, for he was a hardened villain. And when he thought one side was done, he turns it over to fry the other. And what would you think? But the devil, a taste of a burn was on it uh, at all, at all. And sure, the soldier thought it was a queer throat that could not be briled. But, says he, I'll give it another turn by and by, little thinking what was in store for him, the haven. Well, when he thought that side was done, he turns it again, and lo and behold, the devil a taste more done the side, that side was, nor the other. Bad luck to me, says the soldier, but that beats the world, says he. But I'll throw you again, my darling, says he, as cunning as you think yourself. And so with that he turns it over and over, but not a sign of the fire was on the pretty trout. Well, says the desperate villain, for sure, sir, he was a desperate villain entirely. He might have, he might know he was doing a wrong thing, seeing that all his endeavors was no good. Well, says he, my jolly little trout, maybe you're fried enough, though you don't seem over well dressed, but you may be better than you look, like a singed cat. And a tidbit, after all, says he. And with that, he ups with his knife and fork to taste a piece of the trout. But, my jewel, the minute he puts his knife into the fish, there was a murder and screech that you'd think the life would leave you if you'd heard it. And away jumps the trout out of the frying pan into the middle of the floor, and on the, on the spot where it fell up, there's a lovely lady, the beautifulest creature that ever eyes have seen, dressed in white and a band of gold in her hair, and a stream of blood running down her arm. Look where you cut me, you villain, says she, and she held out her arm to him, and my dear, he thought the sight had leave his eyes. 